Thank you for those kind words. <clears throat> the lighting is low because it's wartime and we need to save energy. <clears throat> it is, in fact, the 1st of December, 1941. And there is a young female student who has just spent a term of her second year in Cambridge. She's been studying classics and she's now going home to spend Christmas with her parents. On the 8th of December, she and her parents turn on the radio and they hear, first of all, the news that Malaya has been invaded. Shortly afterwards, they hear that Pearl Harbor has been attacked and then that Manila has been attacked. And so an air of gloom falls upon her family. Britain has already been at war for more than a year and she doesn't know, nor do her parents know, what this is going to mean for her. So Christmas is a rather subdued affair. Shortly after Christmas, she receives in the post a buff envelope addressed to her by name. And it tells her that she should go <coughs> up to the Admiralty Building in London and go to room 39 where she is to ask for a 17F. That's all the information she has. So she makes the journey. She doesn't know what it's for. There's no explanation. She knocks on the door and is admitted. And there is 17F, the man you see on the right. A few people may recognize him. We'll come to his identity later. Uh, he doesn't introduce himself, but he does ask you to sit down. And then he asks you a series of questions that you find very mysterious. He wants to know what languages you have studied. Well, you're doing classics, but he wants to know if you've ever perhaps visited Turkey and learnt a bit of Turkish. And you have actually got a neighbour who's Iranian, so you've learnt a bit of Iranian from that neighbour. And then he asks you if you do crosswords. Are you musical? Well, you do have a couple of musical friends and occasionally you play in a quartet together, so yes, you are a bit musical. And he wants to know a few other details like that, and then he says, thank you, you may go. And you have no idea what this is about. You don't feel like asking him, certainly not who he is, you don't even feel like asking him what this is all about. If you attempted to do so, you think he would just say, thank you, you may go now. So you leave, and you go back home much more puzzled than you were before. But a week or two passes, and then you get another buff letter in the post, and it tells you that you have to go to the gas showroom in Bedford on the 2nd of February and not return to Cambridge. You have no idea what this is about. So what is it that she is getting involved in? Uh, why does it all have to be so secret? That is the subject of my lecture this evening. But before we get on to that, um, I must thank... Christina for that very kind introduction and more than that the University of British Com Columbia for inviting me to give uh, the Howes lecture this year. Um, Joshua Mosto glossed over it a bit um, but it was my fault that I couldn't come uh, last year in November um, because both my parents fell and died so I had to cancel the lecture but I'm very grateful for having been uh, brought back um, at this time um, and I am particularly interested um, in the connection with John Howes, who unfortunately I didn't meet, but whose initial introduction to Japanese through the US Naval Language School um, coincides with uh, an area of research that I've been pursuing over the last couple of years when I came across a few <coughs> excuse me, neglected archives um, and a few individuals um, whose wartime experiences um, had never been brought to light. They had never been approached, they'd never been asked about them. So let us turn on to that. And this is a story that really concerns the Japanese ambassador in Berlin and I will shortly show you a, a clip from a newsreel um, in 1941. But many of you may be thinking about The Imitation Game, the film that appeared a couple of years ago um, about Alan Turing and the Enigma machine. Um, and it's a similar kind of story uh, that we're dealing with today. But there's one big, big difference. 
Brilliant though the work of following the codes and the changes with the Enigma machine and producing decrypts from German transmissions were, what you get at the end of the day is German. And there was no problem in Britain or the United States or Canada or Australia reading the German. When you were dealing with the purple machine, which was the Japanese diplomatic code machine, what you get out of it is Japanese. And as you will see shortly, um, it was not even a particularly easy kind of Japanese. But more of a problem was the fact that there were very, very few people um, who could make sense of this, who had a good training in military Japanese. So the problem in the case of the Japanese ciphers and encrypted messages was not so much the ciphers, but it was the language that resulted when you had decrypted the telegrams. So let us just look at a newsreel. ま、東京政権迫の森から国民の予防を創建に明報ドイツに使いする大島大使の総公会は1月15日日比谷公会堂に開催松岡外相末務大使と遠山光氏徳富総合氏北東ドイツ大使ら小野本立て大使を激励これ
teaching Japanese to uh, young men from 1943 <coughs> onwards uh, for the same sort of purposes. So a very innocuous name was given to this, <coughs> and it was established in Hong Kong in 1935, and they were beginning to, in, to intercept messages, um, but the messages were, of course, all enciphered, and uh, they therefore needed uh, to be broken. And it's at this point we begin to, in, to encounter two individuals who played an enormously important part in the decrypting of the messages that that German ambassador, whom I showed you in the newsreel, was sending back from Berlin. We'll come back to those again later. One of the two individuals was John Tiltman, who was a natural cryptographer, um, a brilliant cryptanalyst, um, who left a long memoir about his activities uh, decoding the Japanese messages. This memoir is uh, in the British National Archives um, and is closed. It may not be consulted. However, um, the British sent a copy of this to the US National Archives during the war, and that, for some strange reason, is accessible. So I got my, <laughs> I got my copy of it from the US. In August 1939, the Far Eastern Combined Bureau moved to Singapore because Hong Kong was felt to be uh, rather more at risk. Um, and then after December 1941, after the attacks on Malaya and Pearl Harbor, the whole operation was moved uh, to uh, Colombo, Delhi and Mombasa. But one member of the group, um, Arthur Cooper, um, resolved to stay behind and he left Singapore on the last boat in February 1942. Now, Arthur Cooper was another uh, rather strange but brilliant uh, individual. He had a pet gibbon, uh, which he insisted uh, he would take with him when he was evacuated from Singapore. He was a, a linguist who had picked up uh, Icelandic in a couple of weeks on a cycling tour around Iceland. He knew Swedish. He had lived in Japan. Um, he had the kind of mind that that young woman over there had, um, an interest in languages, an interest in puzzles, and was able um, very quickly to start using his knowledge of Japanese, but more important, his intuition as a cryptanalyst to begin work on the Japanese codes. <clears throat> well, as you all know, um, the events of the 7th and 8th December, um, followed by the uh, sinking of two British battleships on the 10th of December, and then the surrender of Hong Kong on the 20th, on Christmas Day of 1941, and then ultimately the surrender of Singapore on 16th February happened in uh, quite rapid succession. And it was at this point, only at this point, that the warnings that many people had been making uh, well before the war um, began to be heeded. And those warnings were that if you want to have a cadre of people who know Japanese, and can deal, for example, with interrogation or translation or decrypting, then you can't expect people to pick Japanese up in the same time as you pick up German. Um, you need to allow several years for the process. That point was being made from 1939 onwards. Um, it was being made in the United States, it was being made in England, and for all I know, it was being made in Vancouver. Uh, but nothing happened until the events of December 1939. Uh, sorry, December 1941. And it was at this point that uh, two plans were drawn up in England uh, to train speakers of Japanese <coughs> me, very rapidly. Tiltman, the one who had been uh, based out in Hong Kong, um, said that we need a large number of cryptanalysts and they need to be uh, people who know Japanese. Um, so he was interested in training people in Japanese for a very specific purpose. Um, and he considered that it was possible to do that in six months. And as you will see in a few moments, um, it was possible to do that uh, in such a way that people who had studied Japanese for six months could read sentences that the many distinguished professors of Japanese in this audience will not be able to understand. That I guarantee. So that was one thing, uh, a secret set of courses which would be ultimately in, uh, intended to create a cadre of Japanese knowing cryptanalysts. But there were other needs as well. There were needs for people who would be dealing with eavesdropping, that is listening to air-to-air -air communications or air-to-ground communications which are always in the clear. But that clear is Japanese, so you needed to be able to listen to and distinguish the kind of Japanese spoken by um, 
uh, airmen, uh, for example, in the Burma campaign. You need also people who could interrogate uh, um, prisoners, people who could understand and deal rapidly with captured documents. And for that purpose, um, a set of courses was set up at SOAS, which I won't talk about today, except at the very end because of the Canadian connection, as you will see. And so, uh, you turned up um, on the 2nd of February um, at the gas showrooms in Bedford, um, and uh, you found yourself um, in a rather strange group of people. Um, as a woman, you were one of only two. Um, the rest were men, about 28 of them. And your teacher was a rather elderly man, um, aged in his 60s. He had already been retired, uh, Captain Tuck of the Royal Navy. He had last been in Japan in 1906, but, but he had been a language officer for five years, his knowledge of Japanese was good, and ever since he had last been in Japan, he'd been working as a translator of documents, manuals, and so on for the Navy. So in terms of military language and the structures of the kind of Japanese you needed to deal with decrypts, um, he was considered to be the best option, and he did a remarkable job. So the need was to recruit people, and it was all to be done secretly. That's why she didn't know what it was all about until she turned up in Bedford. 17F. Did anybody recognize him? James Bond? He was Ian Fleming. Uh, he, was em he was employed in the British Secret Services, and he was given the task in London um, of interviewing those who were um, living in or near London. In other cases, people were interviewed in Oxford or Cambridge because, probably for snobbish reasons, uh, Tiltman preferred to hire Oxford and Cambridge students. So, uh, in February 1942, the um, small class begins, and the first thing they're told is that their activities are governed by the Official Secrets Act. They cannot, for the rest of their lives, tell even their nearest and dearest what they're doing. So after you've done your course, when you went back home and your parents asked you what you were doing, you could just say, I was doing clerical work. Your father and mother were a bit disappointed. Surely you're capable of better things than that. But you were unable to tell them what you had been doing. And you, in fact, never told them because you kept the secret, as many, many did. What's more, all you knew was that you had to learn Japanese. You didn't know what it was for. In the course of time, you gradually might have guessed, as you will see in a moment. But the purpose of the course was not made clear. All that you knew was that you had to learn Japanese in a terrible hurry and that a lot of lives depended upon it. I haven't been able to find any photographs of that first course, but here is a photograph of the fifth course. I might mention some of the names uh, later on, but Captain Tuck, you can see, um, it was his fine naval bearing in the middle. Um, on the end of the second row is Denise Newman, um, who was there because she had grown up in Iran. Her father was a petroleum executive, so she'd grown up bilingual and was considered to have uh, very good linguistic talents. She also had uh, remarkable talents as an athlete she took part in the 1948 uh, Olympic Games um, as a diver. Most of these people went on to have remarkable careers, but there won't be time to talk about them all today. So, uh, you turn up for your first class. Um, you expect to be given grammar books. Um, you might be given a dictionary because um, a couple of dictionaries that were produced in Japan had then been illegally, but during the wartime it was allowed, reprinted in America. For example, the one on the left of the screen, the usual Kenkusha Japanese English Dictionary in the Harvard edition produced um, very quickly in 1942. Um, other dictionaries were made available and produced um, either in the UK or in the US or in Canada or in Australia, but you had no textbook. So how are you going to learn the basics of Japanese grammar? Well, you're going to have it dictated to you. This is from the notes of Patrick Field. Patrick Field is one of a small number of individuals <coughs> who were her classmates back in 1942 um, who's still alive. I found it difficult to contact some of them. Um, eventually I managed to get a phone number and his rather formidable wife answered the phone and asked why I wished to speak to him. 
And she said, nobody's approached him about this before, but in any case, you can't talk to him. So I thought he is probably ill. Um, and so I asked, why not? And she said, he's in the gym. <laughs> he was already over 90 at the point. So he had to take dictation, and uh, with a sense of the importance of what he was doing, he kept all his notes. And you can see the kind of uh, thing that he had to uh, copy out, um, as dictated to him by Captain Tuck. And they were obviously told um, to write words written in Chinese characters in capitals and Japanese words in uh, uh, lowercase. And so you can see the kind of thing that they had to do. I don't think many students would take Japanese as undergraduate if they had to copy out the entire grammar course. And the kind of sentences they had to deal with are probably a little bit different from the kind of sentences you teach your students in, here in UBC. Um, such as they dive bomb the aircraft carrier. I doubt if many undergraduates know what aircraft carrier is in Japanese, but you certainly had to know it in 1942. Patrick Field also kept notes of the tests he was given. Um, and this is where we have uh, a little bit of fun. <coughs> this sentence, uh, which is the easiest sentence, I might add, comes from his graduating test. He and his fellow students, including that young lady over there, had to uh, translate these into English. Now, it became apparent to them uh, from the kind of messages these were that they were probably decrypts. So by the time they were getting to this end of the course and looking at the kind of things they were having to translate, most of them were beginning to understand that what they were dealing with was not extracts from newspapers or, or telegrams sent to newspapers, but actually material that had been sent as telegrams and been decrypted. So this was the sentence that he got. This comes, was decrypted from the Japanese diplomatic code, uh, which was a katakana-based code, um, and produced a string of letters. It was correctly decrypted, as you see there. Um, so would any professor of Japanese care to translate it? I should add, just to increase your humiliation, that Patrick Field, after six months of Japanese, uh, got it perfectly right. Let me make it just a little bit easier for you. Any guesses? Yeah, this is what usually happens when I bring this up. <laughs> All right, um, I will now show you the answer. Why, you may be thinking, is it kuhi? Because this is telegraphies. We're completely out of touch with telegraphies in all languages now, but in Japanese telegraphies, kuhi is two syllables, kokonoka is four. So kuhi was the normal way of referring to the ninth day of the month. This was a simple telegram from a Japanese diplomatic representative in Zurich to his colleague in, I forget where now, just saying he was going back to Japan on the ninth. Simple as that. Patrick Field got it right. That's what he wrote in English uh, underneath this bizarre string of letters. For all of us, it's really a bit humiliating. <laughs> <clears throat> so after they had done their course in Bedford, most of them had a suspicion that what they were going to be doing was dealing with a rather covert side of the Second World War. And most of them were sent to Bletchley Park, about which I'll say more in a moment. Bletchley Park was the headquarters of the government secret communications during the Second World War, and it's what features in the imitation game. And you will have seen, if you've seen the film, a few scenes showing Bletchley Park, but as I will show you in a moment, those are also a bit misleading. A couple of them were retained as instructors, because Captain Tuck alone couldn't handle the burden of dealing with several courses simultaneously. So two of the best were retained as instructors. And the rest went, as you see, either to the naval or to the army or to the air section of Bletchley, where they were dealing with decrypts and beginning to do the decrypting themselves. So one of the things they had to be taught was not just to translate, it was expected that they knew this language by now, they also had to deal with the decrypting. So Bletchley Park, well that's the Bletchley Park of the imitation game, that's the Bletchley Park of popular imagery. Uh, a fine old English country house with a lot of men hanging around in flannels and jackets. Um, that is entirely misleading. Uh, to start off with, uh, most of the work 
was done in much finer buildings, such as that that you see on the left there, which were drafty, had heating problems, and um, were, as you can see, rather shoddily built. Another difference is that, as you can see from the photo above, uh, there were very large numbers of women working at Bletchley Park as well. At the height, there were some 10,000 working there, and uh, in the Italian um, naval section, all the staff were women. And as soon as Italy capitulated, um, th that entire group of women were put onto a three-month accelerated Japanese course, and they switched over into the Japanese translation and decrypting business. That's another story. After some time in um, Bletchley Park, some of them were sent out to uh, posts nearer the front so they could decrypt messages uh, then and there. This is not really connected with the theme of the talk this evening because I'm mostly talking about diplomatic messages. But for example, some were sent on these hardship postings to Mombasa and to uh, the golf club in uh, Colombo, um, where they had much closer access and could actually pick up the messages as they were being sent, <coughs> excuse me, decrypt them and translate them uh, there and there on the spot um, so that any urgent messages could be passed on uh, without any further delay. So back to Oshiba Hiroshi then, um, that rather remarkable man whom you saw in the news clip, um, who was stationed in Berlin for uh, a very considerable time. He sent back all his messages um, on that machine that you can see on the left. It's called the Purple Machine. Um, this one was picked out of the remains of the German embassy in Berlin uh, when the war ended in 1945. Um, but actually, uh, in the course of 1941, um, the United States cryptanalysts in Maryland um, managed to work out how the purple machine worked. And they constructed a replica, checked it, and found that it was accurate uh, as a transcription machine. And so they made another one and gave it to Bletchley Park. So both sides would have access to the same machine and would enable them to decrypt diplomatic messages. We're just talking about diplomatic messages here because there were different codes for the Army, different codes for the Army Air Force, different codes for the Navy, and so on and so forth. The diplomatic code was purple and it used those machines and the, the, uh, the intelligence that came out of it uh, was called magic. Now, the important thing, two important things about uh, Oshima, uh, one of them is his remarkable knowledge of German. His father was a German speaker and had spent time in Germany and considered that a knowledge of German was desirable in his son. So he sent his young son to live with German families during the week um, while he was growing up in Tokyo. So Oshima Hiroshi had a very good knowledge of German from childhood, but he also had experience on the ground. As you can see, he was military attaché in Berlin and Vienna, um, and he was simultaneously a lieutenant general in the army and also fulfilling diplomatic posts, making use of his, his very good knowledge of German. He had a time back in Japan um, after the tripartite pact uh, was uh, negotiated and then the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact, which came as a surprise to Japan. But then, uh, evidently on Hitler's request, he returned in 1941, and that was the um, return that you saw in the newsreel, and he remained in office until 1945. And throughout those uh, four years when he was in Berlin, he was sending messages more than twice a day, in 1944 alone, he sent 600 messages back to Tokyo. Some of them were as long as 20 pages. And all of these were, of course, encrypted. But they were sent from Berlin to Tokyo. And in those days, they had to be relayed. So they were relayed before the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union via Moscow and Beijing but after the invasion, probably along the southern route. It doesn't really matter what the route was. They were picked up in Britain, in Bletchley Park, before they reached Tokyo. 
and then the decryption process could begin before decryption was even going on in, in Tokyo. So one of the important things about Oshima um, is his remarkably good knowledge of German. And that made possible the other remarkable thing about Oshima. Here is the embassy in which he was based, and you can see uh, it bedecked with the flags, the Nazi flag and the Italian fascist flag. Uh, but much more interesting are these photographs. Um, this is the point at which he meets Hitler on his return to Germany in 1941. And then he was asked to present his credentials not in Berlin in the Chancellery, but actually in Hitler's retreat in Berchtesgaden. And he does so there in his army uniform with von Ribbentrop in the background. But here uh, you see them talking afterwards. There's not an interpreter in sight, and there never is. Because Oshima not only had a remarkably good knowledge of German, he also established a remarkable personal rapport with Hitler. He often spent hours alone with Hitler, just the two of them, talking things over. So he had um, the finest source of information, and those reports that he wrote back to Tokyo were full of the information that Ribbentrop and Hitler gave him and they left nothing out. And the messages that he sent, as I said, were decrypted straight away um, in Bletchley Park. But what did those messages consist of? Well, as I said, he enjoyed a very close rapport with Ribbentrop, but he also had enormous frequent contacts with Hitler himself, and he assured them both that Japanese codes were robust. That was actually misleading, because the Japanese diplomatic code um, did not change between 1941 and 1945. So um, he had no way of knowing that they were robust. They were, in fact, being read uh, all the time. Now, we have one problem, because we don't actually have his original messages. I'm not sure if that is absolutely correct, but it seems to be so. What we certainly do have are the decrypts and their translations in Bletchley Park and others in Maryland. So we have the messages in the form in which they were decrypted, and that is all. In the, the Foreign Ministry archives in Tokyo, they are apparently uh, no longer to be found. Um, they were presumably destroyed in 1945. And Oshima himself destroyed any of the originals of the messages he wrote in Japanese when the war came to an end. That I need to follow up further and I will do so in Japan later on. So Oshima is meeting Hitler frequently, he's meeting Ribbentrop pretty well every day, he's getting the top secret intelligence summaries from the German side and he's translating that and summarizing it in Japanese and sending it off. What does it actually tell Tokyo? It tells them amongst other things that Hitler is going to invade the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June 1941, Operation Barbarossa. Now, of course, this is decrypted straight away in Bletchley Park, and that very high-value information is passed on to Winston Churchill and passed on to Roosevelt. And they want to warn Stalin, um, but they don't want to reveal the source of the information. So they build up the story of a mole in Berlin, a British mole in Berlin, who has access to high quality information, and they pass that knowledge on to Stalin and tell him that the Germans are going to invade. In fact, Stalin had that information from a number of different sources, but he believed none of it. So that warning um, fell on stony ground. Another important topic that uh, Oshima wrote about uh, was um, the D-Day landings, because the Germans were unsure where those landings would be. Would they be in the Pas de Calais, or would they be in Normandy, or would they be elsewhere? Oshima reported on the discussions, and the most crucial telegram he sent stated that Hitler is convinced the invasion will take place in the Pas de Calais, and is refusing to allow Panzer regiments to move to Normandy because he's so convinced he was right. When that message was decrypted, it showed the 
Canadian, American and British armies in England waiting for D-Day, um, that the deception process, which had taken place over many months, had been successful and they had fooled the Germans into thinking that the Pas de Calais would be the site of the invasion. Oshima also wrote a great deal about what we know as the Ardennes Offensive, the Battle of the Bulge, um, in December 1944. So the Allies knew that uh, a German offensive was taking place. But unfortunately, Oshima never mentioned the place where the offensive would take place. Perhaps he wasn't informed, perhaps he didn't think it important for Tokyo to know that. Um, at any rate, the Allies only had warning that there would be some kind of of attack. As the war near its end, Oshima retained his great optimism about the strength and vitality of the German armed forces and retained the conviction that I suppose he partly got from Hitler that Germany would somehow find a way through in the end through the V weapons um, or some other mechanism. He lived until 1975, took his secrets to the grave. Um, the question is, um, did he know that his messages were being read? Last year, a book was published in Japan by Nahagawa Masahiro, which puts forward the argument that Oshima was a much cannier man than later generations have taken him for, and that he was fully aware that his messages were being read, um, and he was sending the messages back to Tokyo about the, the great strength and remaining vitality of the German armed forces, so as to discourage uh, the Allies from pursuing uh, their further assault on Germany. Um, there isn't any evidence to support this supposition, but it seems to me highly improbable that if he knew that his messages were being read, he would have passed on the information about uh, Operation Overlord Expectations and about Operation Barbarossa, not to mention the Battle of the Bulge in 1944. So, uh, to put it short, I don't buy that argument. But overall, um, it was Oshima's messages, messages from the Japanese ambassador in Berlin, that provided the most important leadway into the mindset of Hitler and to the expectations and plans of the German high command. So, although he was Japanese, although he was writing back to Tokyo, it was actually in the European theater of war that the Japanese diplomatic messages and their decrypts were of most value. There were, of course, many other decrypt operations going on with the Japanese Navy codes, Japanese Army codes, um, and so forth. But just this one individual alone provided a huge wealth um, of information. So let's leave Oshima alone and just deal for a moment um, with the other kinds of courses that were being run. As I mentioned, there was a a continuing and urgent need for people to eavesdrop on air-to-air -air communications, to interrogate captured Japanese, to translate documents which were lost in battle, and there were a surprising number of those, um, and to uh, interpret um, on occasion. So there was a, a great deal of need for people who had a knowledge of, of spoken Japanese. The people in Bletchley Park and that young lady over there, they didn't bother to learn spoken Japanese. That, what wasn't, that was not what was needed. All they needed to do was understand the rather telegraphic language of military Japanese. And that sufficed. And it's for that reason that they were able to train people like her in just six months to be able to deal with that very circumscribed area of vocabulary and that very circumscribed form of Japanese. But of course that wasn't enough. That course was secret, but the other courses were not so secret. So at SOAS, there was a, uh, a set of courses built up designed to train people in these various skills. And it lasted also beyond the war. In the case of the young lady over there, as soon as the war was over, there was no more need to do any more decrypting, so she could go home. Of course, she couldn't tell her parents what she was doing, but she could go home. But in the case of those who were at SOAS or in, um, in Vancouver or in... Um, Colorado or in Sydney, um, there was a need to train people in all these other skills which were needed uh, as part of the war effort. Now, the one snag in England was that there were no Nisei. There was a very, there was a small Japanese community, um, 
and most of them were at first interned on the Isle of Man and then a large proportion were repatriated uh, to Japan in the exchange of um, civilians who were accidentally caught up in each other's countries. So there were no people who could train Englishmen and Englishwomen in Japanese. And it was for that reason um, that Canada comes into the story. Because although, uh, as is well known, um, Nisei were not um, accepted in most of the Canadian forces um, for the duration, most of the war, in the case of Britain, a number of Nisei uh, army men uh, were brought over to teach at SOAS. And you can see here um, a photograph of three of them um, outside um, the SOAS building. Um, I don't know a great deal about them. I'm rather hoping that there may be a descendant here present, but that's probably a bit um, optimistic. And what I do know is that the second of them on the list, James Jitsui Tsubota, had actually fought at Vimy Ridge um, in the First World War and had then re-enlisted on the opening of the Second World War, um, but this time as a teacher of Japanese and was brought over to SOAS. Um, Peter Yamauchi um, seems not to have been able to read or write Japanese, but he had a very good knowledge of the spoken language. And so what these four were needed was for a very different task, um, using um, their knowledge of the spoken language to train uh, young British men and women to undertake those tasks that I mentioned before. That was another huge operation. Most of the people who were involved in that have been quite happy to talk about their experiences because they were not subject to the Official Secrets Act. So that leaves us with a couple of questions which I would like to address now. The Bletchley Park story and uh, the Enigma decryption and the Purple Messages and the production of Ultra and Magic, the two very valuable sources of intelligence, were kept secret until the 1980s. Um, as I said, she was not allowed to tell anybody. Um, when she was married, she didn't tell her husband. Wives didn't tell their husbands either. Husband, wives, didn't, uh, both sides. There was a couple who visited Bletchley Park a few years ago um, because it's now an area that you can go around as a tourist. And they were listening to the explanation of how the decryption machines worked. And at one point, the woman of this couple uh, could not restrain herself anymore and said, you've got it all wrong. Um, that's not how it was done. Um, let me show you what we did. Um, <laughs> and her husband turned to her and said, how on earth do you know that? And she said, well, I've never told you, but I worked here during the war in Hut 6. And he turned to her and said, well, I was in Hut 8. <laughs> and they had kept the secret for 40 years. And that wasn't the case with people in the SOAS courses or the Vancouver course, for example. So it, they kept the secret. Why did it need to be kept secret so long? Well, I think there are two answers. Um, the first, of course, was that they did not tell their ally, the Soviet Union, that they had cracked the codes, nor did they provide them with purple machines or enigma machines. So the alliance involved a major deceit, which in early Cold War Europe was probably best not brought out <coughs> into the public eye. The second reason was that the whole decryption process of Enigma and the purple machines um, showed a very high degree of cryptological skill in Australia, in Britain, in Canada and the USA. And it was not difficult to imagine that had this all been brought into the public domain, it would become clear in the Soviet Union and other presumed hostile countries that their messages were vulnerable. So for those two reasons, the whole operation was kept secret until cryptanalysis and cryptography developed so far that the wartime experiences were no longer relevant. And so in the 80, in 1980s, um, the first hints of what had happened came forward 
and it became possible for those who had taken part to finally tell um, their families what they had done. Many, however, found it impossible to do that and took their secrets to the grave. A few whom I've met have been quite happy to talk, such as the Patrick Field I mentioned. The second question is, what happened afterwards to the young men and women who, who learnt Japanese during the war? Uh, some of them went back to their former careers and interests. Some of the classicists went back to being classicists and became uh, distinguished professors in a number of, of various universities. But for most of them, their lives were changed forever. John Howes is one very good example of that. He presumably would not have uh, ever learnt Japanese had not the opportunity been given him by the, Japanese Na the American Navy Language School in Colorado that he attended. Many others were similarly affected and became teachers of Japanese, but others um, became more interested in China, and a large number of them uh, found their lives changed forever. They had been exposed to Asia in a way in which young men and women were largely not exposed in most of the Western world in the 1940s. Another of the questions which many people have asked is why they had such a positive image of Japan, both during and after the war. Ronald Dore, who's a sociologist of Japan, whose name some of you will certainly know, was uh, asked this question um, at a gathering at SOAS uh, two years ago, um, and he gave the rather politically incorrect answer um, that the ex explanation was simple, and most of the teachers were attractive young, young Japanese women. Um, <laughs> I think his memory was playing fault with him, um, by which I mean that there were a few uh, young women among the teachers, but by far the majority of the teachers were in fact male. But the much more important point is that almost all the teachers who had taken part in the instruction in the SOAS courses in Vancouver and in Colorado, uh, less in Bedford, were people who had lived in Japan before the war. Their experiences had been formed through teaching in universities such as Keio, um, or working for Japanese newspapers, and their experiences are, were of a Japan at peace, not a Japan at war. They were also experiences which had reflected not simply a working environment in Japan, but also an interest in the language and an interest in, um, it may be religion, it may be history. Uh, most of them were quite enthusiastic about their time in Japan, and therefore, alongside the language lectures, um, they gave what we might call these days background lectures. They gave lectures on the history of Japan or the religion of Japan. And most of them conveyed an enthusiasm for Japan and Japanese that was somewhat at odds with the idea that this was an enemy language. Most of those who studied Japanese during the war commented on this afterwards. We never had a sense this was an enemy language. It was a language we were learning to do a job in connection with the war effort. And that's as far as it went. The fourth question here is, what impact did all this have on the post-war development of Japanese studies? Well, it's pretty obvious um, that without these programs, um, there wouldn't have been such rapid development of Japanese studies in Canada, in Australia, in Britain, um, or in the United States. If you run through the biographies of most of the people of John Howe's generation, uh, you will find, like Donald Keane and uh, many others, um, that their first exposure to Japan was as part of the war effort, and they had had no inkling of interest in uh, Asia or Japan until they were forced to do so as part of their contribution to the war effort. And one perhaps more long-lasting effect uh, might be mentioned. Throughout the courses, the focus was exclusively on Japan. It was not on Japan in Asia. Um, so there was very little sense um, of Asia beyond Japan. Most of them became very highly focused uh, on Japan because that's what the task required at the time. These days, uh, here and in universities where Japanese studies are taught, one expects students to have a, a wider grasp of Japan in, in East Asia at least and have some understanding of its connections with China or Korea and so on. But that simply wasn't the case. This was not a university course being taught in wartime. This was a course that was being taught for very specific reasons, and the focus was understandably exclusively on Japan. A final tribute. All those who took part in these courses, including that young lady over there, um, 
got no fame or rewards. There were no medals given. They had no recognition. And for many years, many of them were not allowed to tell what they had done. When I contacted Patrick Field, he told me nobody had taken any interest uh, in his work in the war until I turned up and began to examine all his notebooks and interview him about what he had been doing. But let's remember that in most cases, lives hung on their correct translations. If I may make a mistake in my translations to Japanese, and I have done so in the past, uh, lives have not depended upon that. But for the young men and women, such as John Howes, who were learning Japanese in these contexts, lives hung on their getting their translations right. And I think we owe them all a huge debt of thanks. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.